The average American has just a 1 in 60 million chance of casting a decisive vote in any given US presidential election. These are incredibly low odds. In fact, they're so low, the average American is 4,000 times more likely to be struck by lightning in their lifetime and 16 times more likely to be killed in a shark attack than they are to cast a pivotal vote in a US presidential election. So with such short odds, how can we see such high levels of turnout? How come over 50% of the electorate in the US typically turn out to vote in a US presidential election? Well, to help us answer this question, in the 1950s, US political scientist and economist Anthony Downs introduced what came to be known as the calculus of voting, a mathematical expression used to predict whether someone will go out and vote or stay at home instead. Here, V is the individual's probability of voting. The term PB represents the probability they will be decisive multiplied by B, the total benefit they will get if their candidate won. Think of this B as the difference in satisfaction a Republican voter would get from a Republican president instead of a Democratic one, and vice versa. And then minus C, the cost of voting. This includes the very practical costs of going to vote, such as travelling to a polling station and paying for parking, and also the information gathering used to decide who to vote for, the hours of Fox News or CNN that one might need to be up to date on the candidate's personality and policies. This leads to what is known as the voting paradox. For the rational, self-interested voter, the cost is almost always going to exceed their expected benefit. Even if their benefit is incredibly high, even if they would really prefer Biden to Trump or Trump to Biden, this p-value is just so low. As we mentioned earlier, it's just an estimated 1 in 60 million. So their actual expected benefit, this probability multiplied by their benefit, it's going to be incredibly low as well, near zero. So any cost, such as a travel or information gathering, will almost always outweigh it. Think about this on an individual level. You know the probability of being pivotal in an election is incredibly low. It's actually never happened in US history. So why do you vote? Especially if you're in a safer seat, where Democrats or Republicans typically win all of the electoral college votes. To try and remedy this apparent paradox, Political scientists in the 1970s added a d-term to the equation. This d-term represented all the benevolent reasons one might vote, such as their civic duty or their desire to keep democracy going, as well as the more social outlet of going down to the polling station with their friends. This leads us to the works of Brennan and Lemansky, who concluded that voting is far more of an expressive act than it is an instrumental act of trying to decide who becomes president in some sort of self-interested calculation. In this sense, voting and partisanship have far more in common with supporting a sports team. Despite sports fans not actually being involved in the sport, and their support not increasing the overall chances of their team winning, they still go to the games. Despite having next to no control over whether their team succeeds, they will still be devastated when they lose and jubilant when they win. And we see a number of clear parallels between supporting presidential candidates and supporting sports teams. For one, rallies. In the same way supporters would travel hundreds of miles to watch their team play, political supporters also travel hundreds of miles to watch campaign rallies. There's also the interesting phenomenon of political attire. Supporters will wear campaign branded shirts and hats and even flags in the same way sports fans might. Individuals put up posters to show everyone who they are voting for, as an expressive act to show everyone else their political preferences. It is also important to remember that this p-value is the voter's perceived probability, not the actual probability, as they do not have the ability to calculate the exact probability prospectively before the election. This becomes especially relevant in so-called swing states, where the result is often on a knife edge. There is so much media speculation on Georgia, Pennsylvania and Ohio around the time of a presidential election that we can expect voters, who already have a higher chance of influence in the election, to have an exaggerated expectation of their own probability. And most voters in Florida will remember the 2000 election, when Bush won Florida by just 537 votes. If just 269 Bush voters chose Al Gore instead, Al Gore would have won Florida and subsequently the US presidential election, becoming the most powerful person in the free world and creating an alternate history where the environmental, foreign and economic policy decided in the White House throughout the noughties would be completely different. This demonstrates how not all American voters experience the same odds, and the perceived probability of being decisive in certain swing states will be significantly higher. This is backed up by the data. 
where those in swing states are historically more likely to vote. For example, the 2020 presidential election between Biden and Trump saw key battleground states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Florida experiencing higher levels of turnout than the national average. So there we have it. If we think of voting purely as an instrumental way for us to influence who wins an election, for most of us, it would not outweigh the cost to vote. However, when we consider the expressive qualities of showing your support for your candidate and the satisfaction that you are doing your civic duty, it is understandable that for most democracies, we see a majority of the eligible population going out to vote.